Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. Please visit our website, cscatlanta.org, for a complete list of live and recorded events. We invite you to sign up for our newsletter to stay connected to all future programs. Um, so today we are going to go over the gut health and the mind-body connection. It's very an interesting topic, so hopefully you guys will learn a lot of stuff from it. Um, so some of the objectives are to understand how gut health and the mind-body connection are related and to identify what can be done to mitigate the effects. So it's the song from the Pepto-Bismol commercial. It's like when you have nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. Um, great singing, I know. Um, but that song I just thought was so fitting because most people, when they hear it, they automatically think of Pepto abysmal, but I think of our gut health and our mind body connection because it's all so linked. So, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, did you know that up to 60% of GI diseases are associated with stress? Stress can actually affect all systems of the body, including our cardiovascular system, our respiratory system, endocrine, our GI system, nervous system, muscular and reproductive system. Um, we like to generally think of emotions as either positive or negative emotions. So our positive emotions are things that can provide well-being and pleasure. So things like happiness, um, and our negative emotions can generate the opposite. So things like depression and anxiety. So what is the gut brain axis? Well, it connects the brain to our GI tract. So this links cognitive um, and emotional areas within our central nervous system with our gut. So the connection allows a two-way street in which the brain can drive changes in the gut environment and alter the microbial composition. And in turn, the gut microbiota can influence our emotional processors. So this communication between the central nervous system and the gut microbiota happen through what we call the vagus nerve. And I'm going to go over a diagram to make this make sense a little bit. So this is our gut brain axis. And you can see here that we have our brain up top and then directly from the brain, we can go all the way down to our gut by means of the vagus nerve. And all of this is related. So if um, our brain can communicate through the vagus nerve to our gut, and so if we're experiencing stress, whether it be positive, negative emotions, it could be um, depression, anxiety, any type of stress, this can directly alter our gut microbiota. Um, on the other side, our gut microbiota can, if it's altered, it can directly lead to anxiety and depression and different mental health disorders. So it is, um, uh, it's a cycle that we can get into and it's like, how do we fix this and how do we help our brain help our gut and how do we help our gut help our brain? <clears throat> so this is again, our vagus nerve. Um, it is called our sixth sense. It carries a range of signals from the digestive system to the brain and vice versa. It is responsible for the regulation of things like digestion, heart rate, respiratory rate, coughing, sneezing, swallowing, and vomiting. Um, the most important function is to bring information from our inner organs to so things like our heart, gut, liver, and lungs to our brain. It represents an important link between nutrition and psychiatric, neurological, and inflammatory diseases. So the vagus nerve is, in fact, very important to our body, and it's stuff that we're learning more and more about. Um, I do want to kind of go over the gut microbiome because I did talk about in our, one of our slides the gut microbiota. So let's kind of go over that to explain what that is. Um, so the human body and the GI tract are inhabited by hundreds of trillions of microbes, which are collectively known as our gut microbiome. Some functions of our microbiome include metabolism of nutrients, protein synthesis, immunity. Um, it also helps to regulate with homeostasis, so keeping our body um, the right temperature, just functioning basically regularly. Um, each person does have their own unique gut microbiome, so it's not one size fits all. Everyone's microbiome is different. 
and our microbiomes can be altered by various things. So things like infection, disease, our diet, antibiotics, stress and emotions, um, our brain, the environment, and also our genes. So what can we do to help? Um, we can look at our diet. We can look at our supplementation. We can look at probiotics, exercise, getting enough sleep, um, something called tapping, and all of this stuff I'm going to go over in more depth throughout the presentation. Um, meditation, um, we can look at social workers or ther therapists. Um, so now let's kind of look at our diet. <clears throat> the stress mind-body loop can lead to a long list of issues, but it's also it can also impact our nutritional status. Nutritional deficiencies not only affect our physical condition, but also our mental condition. Um, so some common deficiencies that you may see in mental health disorders, whether it be, again, um, anxiety, depression, um, really any kind of mental health disorders, um, a lot of deficiencies found in those patients are omega-3 fatty acids, are B vitamins. Um, there are certain minerals that are deficient when we're having um, some type of mental health disorder or something called amino acids. Also, um, hunger can lead to changes in our mood. It can lead to changes in our perceptions and our reactions. So um, I know you guys are all familiar with the Snickers commercials. When someone gets really hungry, they might be a, a different person when they're hangry versus when they're fed and full. Um, so some reasons that hunger can also lead to changes in our mood is because our glucose levels trigger the release of hormones that can bring along certain emotions. So if um, we haven't eaten, we're in a glucose depleted state, meaning our glucose is going to be low, which can lead to more impulsive, punitive, and aggression, um, which again, this is like greater negativity all around. Um, this is just really a good diagram to show, um, you know, when we do eat, we eat, whether it be protein, fat, carbohydrates, um, pro and prebiotics, just a various amount of things we eat it. Um, it's going to hit our um, gut bacteria. And whenever we hit our gut bacteria, um, if our microbiota is altered, that's going to affect how we then um, metabolize and absorb different foods. And if we're not absorbing them and metabolizing those foods correctly, then that could lead to a host of different diseases, um, autoimmune diseases, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, obesity, um, just tons of things. So that's, you know, again, a, a whole of like what it looks like when we're eating and when our gut is altered. Um, so let's kind of talk about carbohydrates. Um, they can be found to affect our mood and our behavior. It helps with facilitating the entry of tryptophan, which is also known to promote well-being into our brain. Carbohydrates are um, found in like sugar and sweet foods. They generally tend to have an immediate effect on our mood, but unfortunately it's not a long lasting effect of whether it be like happiness or something like that. Um, vegetables, fruits, and complex carbohydrates bring a moderate but more enduring effect on brain chemistry, mood, and energy. So what that's saying is that, um, you know, you think of comfort foods and comfort foods might be desserts. And when we eat those types of things, we immediately feel pleasure, probably because of that injury of the tryptophan being um, transported into our brain. Um, however, an hour later, we might you know, feel what we call like, um, the sugar rush kind of being gone. So it's not a long lasting effect. Whereas if we're focusing more on like fruits, vegetables, and those types of complex carbohydrates, um, we might have a more, um, consistent increase in mood. So our protein, um, Dopamine and serotonin are neurotransmitters that impact our mood directly. So when um, a limitation of these proteins, a limitation of the dopamine and serotonin can lead to poor synthesis um, and therefore a low mood. So whereas the excess of these neurotransmitters um, may actually lead to brain damage and reduce kidney function. So knowing that we're getting um, the right amount of protein is really important and not under eating or overeating our protein. 
Um, protein in elevated proportion has been associated with higher changes in depression, whereas increased carbohydrate proportion shows less depression and more calmness. So that's also something to kind of um, take to keep in mind. Our fatty acids, um, our brain is a fat rich organ. So our gray matter in our brain, it does contain over 50% of fatty acids. So this is why fat is actually crucial for our health. Even though I know um, historically we've always, you know, been told for weight management we need to have low fat diets, but we are finding that um, good sources of fat is actually very important to not only our brain but hormones, especially for women as we're hitting menopausal, you know, ages. All the fatty acids are super important to us. Um, an adequate intake of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids or PUFAs, they can or they may increase one's susceptibility of depression. And also some other tips um, is that research are, is showing now that increased intake of omega-3 PUFAs may contribute to antidepressant effects and or resistance to depression through anti-inflammatory mechanisms. Also, just another kind of key to take away from this is that DHA is the most abundant PUFA in our brain. Um, and DHA and omega-6 fatty acids cannot be made by the body and they must be supplied by the diet. But again, um, when we're supplementing with these things, you have to be really careful with them because sometimes some supplements can interfere with certain medications that were prescribed. So if you are taking an anti-clotting drug, it is helpful or recommended to speak with your phys physician before just starting um, a fatty acid or omega-3, omega-6 um, supplement. So with all of that being said, what's really the best dietary guidelines? What should we be doing every day? Um, so the prevalence of mental health disorders has increased in developed countries with the rising popularity of the Western diet. So take, think the typical, um, chicken fingers, pizza, French fries, hamburgers, all of those, that's what we consider the Western diet. Um, so what has been found to be super helpful for not only our mental health, but really for a variety of different diseases is the Mediterranean diet. Um, and if you want to learn more about it, definitely do a quick Google um, search on this and you'll find lots of resources on the Mediterranean diet. But research is showing more and more how helpful the Mediterranean diet can be for an, a lot of different diseases. Um, but what what that entails is trying to consume five to nine servings of fruits and vegetables each day. We do want to include beans and legumes at least twice a week. We want to eat three to four ounces of fish twice or more per week. We want to include nuts daily, so about one and a half ounces of nuts each day. We also want to include healthy fats from avocados, fish, nuts, and healthy oils, so things like olive oil, avocado oil, etc. Um, I would go ahead and add in there to uh, more and more people are kind of talking about our oils and just kind of being cautious with seed oils. So things like um, sunflower oil, um, canola oil, vegetable oil, those are the oils that we want to kind of do more research on before using them. But generally people are seeing olive oil um, for lower cooking temperatures and avocado oil for the higher smoking temp or smoking, uh, the higher cooking temperatures because of the smoke point. Um, so things to kind of keep in mind there and just advocate to kind of do more research on those topics. Um, and also avoiding processed foods. So anything basically that's in the middle aisle of the grocery store, we want to try to, um, use with caution. So anything that's um, prepackaged, pre-processed, um, we just want to be careful with because of all of the, the added ingredients that are in there. And then also choosing whole grains. So brown rice instead of white rice, um, wheat bread instead of white bread, that kind of thing. And then also spice up your foods. So add things like garlic, ginger, turmeric, basil, oregano, really in kind of herbs um, and spices that you can stand. It's a great addition to your foods because they do help provide different um, um, properties. Mm -hmm. And then also decrease your alcohol intake. So 
Um, it is recommended that women have one serving or less of alcohol per day and men two servings or less per day. And I did include here what a serving size actually is because I know um, it can be easy when you're pouring yourself a glass of wine just to pour, pour, pour until it looks like it's a great serving for yourself. But uh, really our serving sizes are one and a half fluid ounces of liquor, 12 fluid ounces of beer and five ounces of wine. Okay, so let's get into the vitamins and minerals. Um, again, we did talk about different um, whoop, nutrient deficiencies and how that can lead to um, different mental health disorders. So an overview of our vitamins and minerals that may lead to various mental health disorders are our B vitamins. So things like folate, vitamin B1, B2, B6, and B12. And then um, our vitamin C, magnesium, selenium, zinc, and vitamin D. So B or vitamin B1, um, when we're deficient in this, we might see it come out as poor concentration or a poor attention span. Um, so if you're feeling like you're having any of these issues, it is good to focus on whole grains and certain vegetables that do contain um, your B1. Um, if we're low in vitamin B3, we can see that come out as depression. And again, the food sources are the same, whole grains and vegetables. Um, B5 deficiency, we could see that as a poor memory or um, easily being stressed. Um, and again, whole vegetables and whole grains and whole vegetables would be helpful for that. Um, B6 deficiency can look like irritability, poor memory, stress, or depression. Um, same thing, whole grains and then this one, bananas. And then B12 um, deficiency in that can look like confusion, poor memory, and psychosis. So different food sources for B12 uh, would be things like meat, fish, dairy products, and eggs. Folic acid. So this, if we have a deficiency in folic acid, may look like anxiety, depression, or psychosis. And food sources for that are leafy green vegetables. If we're deficient in vitamin C, that can look like depression for a lot of people. Um, so food sources of that could be bell peppers, tomatoes, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. Um, it could also be fresh fruit, things like oranges, kiwis, lemons, grapefruits, and strawberries. Um, if someone is deficient in magnesium, it may look like depression, it may look like irritability or insomnia. So sources of magnesium are things like green vegetables, nuts, and seeds. I did also just want to highlight, because this isn't a commonly known thing, but magnesium is 99% going to be stored within our bone or inside of our cells or intracellularly. So when we are going to the doctor and we're getting a normal magnesium lab drawn, it's nine times out of 10 going to be serum magnesium that your doctor is drawing, um, which you see here, that's magnesium, our magnesium stores are only 1% going to be found in our, in our um, serum labs. So it is important to find a doctor that you can talk to about this and try to figure out ways to do um, intracellular magnesium testing. If you want to have your magnesium tested for accuracy, um, I've actually had my magnesium tested um, intracellularly and mine was actually low, but my serum looked like it was normal. So I think that is really important. Um, for everyone to kind of know about and, you know, maybe be mindful um, or think about whenever you're talking to your doctor about these labs. Selenium, um, this can look like irritability and depression. So food sources of selenium that we should be incorporating in our diet would be things like um, wheat germs, brewer's yeast, liver, fish, garlic, sunflower seeds, Brazil nuts, and whole grains. Um, when we have a zinc deficiency, it could look like confusion, maybe more or less like a blank mind or a little bit of brain fog, some depression, loss of appetite, and lack of motivation. Um, some good sources of zinc would be oysters, nuts, seeds, and fish. Um, it is thought that our vitamin D supplementation does not help depressive symptoms, but it can help with anxiety symptoms. So if you feel like you're having some depression, maybe your first choice wouldn't be to look at a vitamin D and what your vitamin D levels are, um, but it could help potentially with um, anxiety. So some good food sources of vitamin D are things that are fortified with vitamin D, whether it be dairy or orange juice. 
Um, you can also find vitamin D in salmon, cod liver oil, tuna fish, beef liver, and egg yolk. <clears throat> and some other important tips is always diet over supplements. So we should be focusing more on um, a wide variety of foods in our diets versus um, extra supplements with all of these um, micronutrients that we've just talked about. Um, but there is a time and a place for supplements. And I do get that, but I do want everyone to be mindful that if you are going to start supplements, please, please, please talk with your dietitian or your doctor just to make sure that they're appropriate for you because some of them can interfere with, um, whether it be chemo regimen, certain medications, there are lots of things that it could interfere with. So prior to starting anything new, you definitely want to talk to a professional and make sure that this is the best for you. Um, so probiotics, they are generally thought to be helpful with our microbiota, um, and it is thought that the manipulation of the gut microbiota by probiotic ingestion can influence mood and cognition. So there are lots of studies showing that probiotic supplementation may help to decrease anxiety and depression, um, but it is important to note that most of these studies are showing that the strain is super, super important. So the two strains, Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium, they're the ones that are that have been shown the most helpful with anxiety and depression. Um, so when you're looking at probiotics, you do want to look at the label and look at what strain you're actually taking. Um, a brand name to consider would be Calm Biotic. And if you're wanting to find more information on probiotics, I did include a probiotic chart that you can search. Um, it will show lots of different things that probiotics and the certain strains, what it can be helpful for. Um, so whether it be constipation, diarrhea, there's different strains of probiotics to help with all of those things. So that's a good chart to kind of refer back to. Um, also, before I get off the topics of probiotics, this is another good thing you would want to talk to your doctor, your dietitian about, because there are certain populations that probably don't need probiotics because it is, they are live active cultures. So um, it is something, again, to kind of run by your doctor or dietitian prior to starting probiotics. Um, exercise can also alter our gut uh, microbial communities. Um, so there's lots of good things that exercise can help with. It can help with our gut to help decrease colon cancer, IBD or inflammatory bowel disease and diverticulosis. It can help with our brain um, by helping to improve depression and anxiety. It can also help with our fat and our muscles within our body. And then also our other organs like our liver and bones and heart and skin. Um, but the question that a lot of research is kind of looking at is what, what's the mode of exercise that's the most beneficial? Is it just walking? Is it running? Um, also, what's the intensity? So how hard are we walking? How hard are we running? How hard are we weightlifting? Also, how often? So the frequency, are we doing it three times a week? Are we doing it seven times a week? What's the best? And then also duration. So how long? Um how long is exercise recommended? Um, I think right now the general recommendations are for 30 minutes a day for at least five days a week and doing at least two or three of those days as strength training to help kind of build our, our bones. And then um, at least two of those days, some type of cardiovascular exercise, whether it be walking or swimming. Um, but again, before starting exercise, it's good to talk to your physician and make sure that it's appropriate for you. Sleep is also crucial um, for lots of our health, um, but there are studies that do show that sleep deficiency changes activity in some parts of our brain. So if you're um, lacking sleep, you may have trouble making some decisions. You may have trouble solving problems, controlling your emotions and behavior, and coping with change. Sleep deficiency has also been directly linked to depression. Um, so that's all you know something to kind of keep in mind. And I know the question for you, maybe how much sleep is enough sleep to help with all of these things. So per the Academy of Sleep Medicine, adults over the age of 18 need between seven and eight hours of sleep each night. So that's kind of the goal to be aiming for. Whoopsies. Let me get back. Um, so what else can be done to help with our gut brain access? And there is lots and lots of talk these days about um, vagus nerve stimulation. So thinking back to one of the first slides when we talked about our vagal nerve, um, this is what it's referring to. And um, 
a lot of people also talk about are what's called vagal tones. So some people may have a high vagal tone, meaning that your body, once you are um, introduced to a stressor or an event that may make you nervous or may make you stressed or anxious, if we have a high vagal tone, our body can calm down and relax faster after that stressor. Versus if we have a low vagal tone, it takes our body a lot of time to kind of get back to baseline. Um, so in order to help with your vagal tone, there are things that can be done. And that's again called the vagus nerve stimulation. So what can we do to help support our vagal tone? Um, we can use some essential oils. We can, and I think there's a slide on essential oils coming up, so I'll go over that in a minute. Um, we can do things like cold exposure. So I'm sure you've all heard of the cold plunge um, or ice baths. A lot of people will sit in cold water to kind of get them that cold exposure to help support their vagal tone. Um, so maybe you've seen this going around social media or in the internet, and that's that's why people are doing the cold exposures and the, the cold ice baths, because that is helping with the vagal tone and help to increase that vagal tone so that you can respond to stressors better. Um, also, other things that you can do is um, deep and slow breathing. So kind of there are lots of different um, techniques out there for breathing, but some of them could be like, hold your, breathe in for four seconds, hold your breath for seven seconds, breathe out for three seconds, and then kind of keep doing that. Um, and so that could be something that you work on periodically throughout the day, just to kind of help support your vagal tone. Um, and again, these kind of things that we're talking about, it is going to be something that's going to take a lot of practice and a lot of um, repetition to kind of help over time work on that vagal tone. Other things that you can do to help support your vagal tone are things like socializing and laughing. So being around people you love, that people that make you happy and people who make you laugh, because um, that is shown to help support vagal tone. Also, there's something called emotional freedom technique or tapping, and that's been really um, helpful to support vagal tone for a lot of people. And just a kind of very brief overview, um, tapping is done um, in various ways ways, I guess. Um, there's lots of different um, things that you can Google on tapping. And there is also, um, I'm trying to find a, no, I had an app on my phone that I was going to tell you guys about. It's called Tapping Solution. And you can download that and it can help guide you on different tapping techniques. And so tapping may be tapping your chest and maybe tapping back here. It could be tapping all over your body. And that tapping is just over time going to help um, and it can help support your vagal tone. Um, other things to support help vagal tone will be things like meditation. It's been super, super helpful for a lot of people. Um, yoga can be really helpful. Massage, um, acupuncture, things also like grounding. This is a really easy thing that you can do for free at home every day. Um, you just go outside and you're with your bare foot. So no socks, no shoes. You stand touching the earth with your feet and that is going to help over time um, help support your vagal tone. And then also speaking to a therapist or a counselor, um, help work through your whether it be um, past trauma or just currently, you know, things that you can do to help um, work on your mental health. Um, so essential oils, I this is kind of um, the overview for those. So um, they are thought to affect a person's psychology and they can help to regulate emotions. Um, there are a few oils that have been studied um, to help specifically reduce anxiety and depression, and those are frankincense. So generally, studies looked at frankincense um, essential oils being applied topically to your neck. So none of this is ingesting. It's all um, via either smell or just putting it on, the, on your skin. Um, but then other things that have been shown to be helpful for anxiety and depression via smell is Ling Ling, Neroli, Bergamot, Sweet orange, lemongrass, lavender, grapefruit, um, rosemary, geranium, rose, and um, sage. So those are all, if you're into essential oils, those would be good ones to get um, for if you're having any anxiety or depression. And then just a little bit of food for thought as we wrap things up. Um, 
I did think this is pretty interesting. So based on Lowen's concept, one or a set of negative emotions over an extended period of time um, can actually lead to chronic illness. So a lot of people, you know, feel like what we're thinking in our head mentally, that can in turn have a huge, um, a huge role in how our thought process goes, how our disease states go, how our, um, a response to certain medications and treatments can go. So, um, a lot of people, you know, have, whoop, sorry, a lot of um, theories do suggest that emotional regulations um, may actually impact our health and can help explain certain observed associations of positive and negative emotions within your, you know, certain health condition. So, I thought that that was pretty interesting to kind of keep in mind that. Um, not only can our mental health really help um, with a lot of different aspects in life, um, but also, again, as we've learned, our gut health is directly related to our mental health. And so really just looking at it as like a whole picture, looking at not only what we're eating, but what we're doing, what we're exposing our body to, all of these things can be um, super important and helpful to think about. So that is... That's it for today. Thank you for joining Cancer Support Community Atlanta for this program. If you're interested in other live or recorded programs, please visit the online program tab of our website, cscatlanta.org. Or follow us on Facebook. We'll be sharing additional information on upcoming programs.